Well, let's open up our, our Bibles again to 1 Thessalonians. And we're in chapter 4 now. And I would greatly appreciate your prayers. I am, I am not feeling good this evening. Before we get started, I would just like to say something as a father to the fathers that are here. Um, and I'm saying this about myself also. You know, it's, it's, it's really great how um, I think so many have trained their children to sit and listen to the preaching. And I so applaud that and I think people have done wonderfully in that. But I also want to share with you that after the preaching, that if you're fellowshipping or counseling or something, always keep one eye on your child. It doesn't do that much good to train them to sit still in church for the preaching if afterwards they're all running around like a bunch of wild banshees. And I think that sometimes we as homeschoolers, especially moms, you just want to talk to an adult so bad that you can kind of zone out. And fathers, you know, this is your time to kind of take the lead. And I'm saying this about myself. I'm saying this to each of you. Um, our children ought to have a good time and it's going to get warm so pretty soon we're going to be able to get them outside but uh, let's also look at training them after the service and before the service uh, especially when we have when we have guests and maybe you know an uh, elderly gentleman comes to church and gets bulldozed by about four four year olds and uh, so we just need to keep an eye on that and uh, really seek to to honor God in all of this. All right, well, let's, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says in verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you, receive from us, as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandment we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I so desire for Christ to be honored tonight. And I long for your people to be helped. And Lord, I have a sense of such great inadequacy. Lord, my heart is in it. My mind is struggling. And I pray, Lord, that you would use this time to speak to your people. That we would see that it is our great calling to live in a manner that pleases you. To grow in sanctification in every aspect of our life. To be holy as you are holy. To love as you love. Father, I pray that in these words, that there would be more than just information, but also exhortation, and not simply man to man, but that your Spirit, Lord, would help us. Lord, we have nothing. The flesh profits nothing. It is only your spirit and only your grace. Lord, bring things to mind that ought to be said. But most of all, that your spirit would, would use even the foolishness of preaching to transform lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we start off here with the word finally. If you look in verse 1. And Paul does not mean that immediately he's going to simply end the epistle. Because if you're looking at everything and you can judge dimensions, you see that we're barely halfway through the epistle. So what, what does Paul mean by saying finally? Did he really mean to stop and then all of a sudden he just realized he needed to go on again? Absolutely not. The word would probably be better translated furthermore. It is one of the ways in which Paul divides up a book. 
Having discussed one matter, he's now going to another matter. Now we can see this in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 1. Paul uses this same word to divide the book into two different segments. And that's what he's doing here in 1 Thessalonians. Up until this point, we have received from Paul exhortation, uh, instruction, encouragement. But also and mainly what we've received from Paul is what we call a personal narrative. He's been telling us what's been going on with the believers in Thessalonica. And he's also been telling us what's been going on with him. And then he's also been giving us what we would call a personal defense of his own ministry. Now he's not doing this because he's proud. He's doing this for the sake of the gospel. His ministry is under attack. And so he has been responding, not for the sake of his reputation, but for the sake of the gospel, that it not be maligned. But now Paul is going to do something different. He's going to switch gears. And what are we going to get mainly from Paul now? We're going to get instruction. We're going to get exhortation. And we're going to get encouragement. That's what the rest of this letter is chiefly about. And the Lord knows that that's exactly what we need in our lives. Now, if you look, he says, finally, then um, I would have preferred if they would have if he would have said or they would have translated it. Finally, therefore, because it it demonstrates that there's a great link before between what has come before and what is now going to come. Now, the word then in the New American Standard, or the word therefore in Greek, is linking something. It's going to link chapter 4 to all of chapter 3, chapter 2, and chapter 1. But specifically, it's going to link us back to chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. Now, in verse 10, what does Paul do? In verse 10, Paul says that he desires to do what? To complete what is lacking in the faith of the Thessalonians. And then in verse 13, what does he say? He's praying, what? That they will be established without blame, blamelessly in holiness. So that's what Paul is desiring. And now in chapter 4, he's going to begin to work that out. He's going to begin to teach. He's going to begin to instruct. He's going to begin to exhort and encourage. Why? So that... You and I will do the very thing he's, he's desiring. That our faith will increase and abound. That it will grow stronger. And also that we will become established in holiness. And that's the theme of our topic here. Now, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we need to go through some of these logistics. Just so you can have an understanding of the text. If you look in chapter 4 verses 1 through 12 you find that it basically divides. It divides in three sections. First of all, he's going to give us exhortations in verse 1. Exhortations to do what? To live in a way that is pleasing to God. And then from there, he's going to mention two specific areas in which we can and should please God. The first one is our sanctification. Now we're going to go on to explain what that means. But sanctification, brothers and sisters, is key in the Christian life. It's about growing in genuine devotion, genuine piety, genuine conformity to Christ. And he's going to specifically, although we're not going to touch on it tonight, but next week, he's going to specifically deal with sexual purity. Because in the Roman Empire... This is where the great problem was found. And in our culture today, it's the same thing. And so Paul, when he talks about sanctification, the first thing he's going to do is run over to sexual purity. And he's going to hammer it. He's going to tell us why it is so necessary. And why sexual impurity is so dangerous. But he's not going to stop there. After he talks about sanctification, what is he going to do? Well, if you see in the latter part of, of verses 9 through 12, he's going to talk about love, about brotherly love. And when we put all this together, what we see is this. If you want to know how to please God, to genuinely live a life that will bring joy to the heart of God, 
then you have to take seriously two things. One, growing in holiness. Now stop for a moment and ask yourself, how seriously do you take this? In your inward man, in your speech, in your actions. Holiness. And then he's going to include with that love. It's almost like he is talking about two different things, but it's almost like he's talking to the same thing about the same thing. Or at least we could say almost he's talking about two sides of the same coin. Because if we are holy, we will love. And if we love, we'll take holiness seriously. Now, in this sermon, we're going to try to look at three things. I Honestly, I keep cutting it down to eventually I think I'm just going to preach one word each Wednesday because the sermons are so long and I'm so sorry. But there are three things that I want to talk about. The first is the will of God for every believer. And that's their sanctification. Secondly, the goal of sanctification. You see, many people believe sanctification is the goal. It's really not. The goal of sanctification, of becoming more and more holy, practically, is that we be pleasing to God. That's the great goal. That you and I bring joy to the heart of God. And then we're going to talk about the means of sanctification if we have time. And that is instruction, encouragement, and exhortation. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm going to hammer this. These words are going to come up quite often. This is one of the reasons why you need the community This is why you need preaching, but not just preaching, that you need genuine fellowship. That includes what? Instruction. Exhortation. It's not it's not enough just to give information, but to plead and to urge because this is a serious matter. And then also encouragement, encouragement. Now, let's start in verse three and we're going to look at the will of God for every believer. It's their sanctification. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, at the very beginning of the verse, I don't want to be nitpicky, but you see the preposition for, right? You see the preposition for. Well, it connects this verse to the previous two verses. And the previous two verses are basically talking about this. And again... I know I'm being repetitive, but I'm not trying to give you a grammar lesson. I'm trying to bring home a very important point. Verses 1 and 2 speak about Paul's desire for believers everywhere to be pleasing to God. To be genuinely pleasing. That when he looks at you, he is well pleased. Well, verse 3 tells us what has to happen in order for that to occur. And that is that you and I must grow in sanctification. We must change. We must be transformed in every aspect of our life. Now, if you look, he says, for this is the will of God. The will of God. Now, the word will here is thelema. And it means will. But also it can be translated desire. And I think this is very important. When I look at the Greek word itself. And then I look at the character of God as we know him. His love, his grace, his kindness. Then we understand that when it says the will of God for you. It's not talking about some cold or calculated or impersonal will. What it's talking about is a warm, affectionate, loving, interested desire for you from the one who loves you supremely and the one who is working for your ultimate good. And that's a great encouragement. He's not just saying, I command you to be this way, but I will that you be this way with authority. It is a command, but it's because I love you, because I'm concerned for you. Isn't this the very trouble we have with our own children? They say, why, why these commands? Why these rules? Why these prohibitions? Do you want to be the one who kills all joy? No, we want to be the ones who cultivate joy in you. But there are some things that are deceptive that make you think they will bring you joy when they will not. 
They simply will not. They're deadly. They're deaf. And so when God says this is His will, He's saying it as a father. Listen to me. I've walked with the Lord longer than some of you have been alive. And I'm not known as a touchy-feely sort of person. But I can attest to this. God is love. He really is love. And when He gives a command or He gives a prohibition, or even when He strikes us, it's love. It really is. And that's one of the reasons why you should always listen to Him. He really does love you. And therefore, He speaks in wisdom. Now, I want us to look... When I think about the will of God, I want to give you two of my favorite verses. And it kind of sets the tone for what I think Philema is saying here. Listen to the first verse. It's in Jeremiah 29, 11. Just listen. God is speaking and He says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. What is God's will for you? To give you a future. Now, I want you to realize something. If you read very carefully the book of Proverbs, the book of Psalms, you understand the wicked have no future. Man, because of his fallenness, has no future. None. And the fact that God has decreed, has willed that he give you a future is amazing. And the wicked have no hope, the Bible says. And the Bible even says we're not to grieve like those who have no hope in the face of death. But God gives us a future and a hope. And how does he do it? He does it by the redemptive work of Christ. But, believer, listen to me. He also does it in your life through sanctification. Taking you away from everything that will harm you. And bringing you, drawing you into that which is good. Also Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. Now, I want to say something. I know these texts have been twisted by prosperity preachers, TV preachers, to say that God wants you to have ease of life, that there's never a calamity, that He wants you to prosper materially and physically and all these things. The emphasis in everything that they give to that is just wrong. And it demonstrates in many ways that their God is their belly. But I want you to see that at the same time, don't shut these verses out. I just want you to see that they're promising something so much higher than what most preachers will tell you. What are they promising? Not that you'll, you'll in the will of God, you'll never suffer. No, you may suffer tremendously. They're not saying that in the will of God you'll always prosper. No, you may suffer poverty. But what it is promising is this. In the will of God there will be. And as you grow older this becomes more and more important. There will be wellness of soul. Some of us men. Lived a long time before we were converted. We know emptiness. Darkness. Darkness. We know evil. We've been part of it. We know there is no wellness. There is nothing whole in that kind of life. But God promises those who walk in His will to have wellness of soul. To have salvation in full color. To have tremendous capacity to love God. And to love our fellow man. To have tremendous capacity for joy. To have the presence of God throughout all eternity. That's what these things are promising us. This is God's will for you. The end. The glory of the end of God's will will outweigh anything that you have to suffer. In the middle of God's will before the end comes. Now. I want you to also notice something that's very important here. It says, and this is the will of God for you. But 
in the Greek, the article's not there. And it is kind of important that it's not there. And what it, what it means is this, is that it's not implying that sanctification is the totality of God's will for you. That's not what that means. That the only thing God wills for you is that you every day strive to be holy. That's not what it's saying. So the will of God is not consumed just by sanctification. Although sanctification is an extremely important part of the will of God. Because sanctification functions almost as a pathway that opens up all the other possibilities to all the other aspects of God's will. The man, the woman who takes sanctification seriously will also be privy, will also experience so much more of the fullness of the will of God. And, and here's something that I want you to see that I think is so very important is that, you know, when I go hunting, uh, I don't I don't have bad eyesight, but I just don't see the animals. And one time I asked a physician, why is it that my eyesight's actually better than my friend, but my friend can see the animals? He said, what you don't understand, Paul, is that everybody's colorblind to a certain degree. He says, you may see no difference between one shade and another shade of brown, while your friend sees several different shades in between that. So he's seeing things that you simply cannot see. Now, why do I say that? Those who walk in the will of God for an extended period of time, you know, as they're growing, as they grow older, they see the will of God as a much wider path. So intricate, so beautiful, with so many possibilities that maybe the younger Christian or the Christian who's not given himself to the study of Scripture, or given himself to take sanctification seriously, that they simply cannot see. So when you take sanctification seriously, I'm not talking about legalism, I'm not talking about some monastic drudgery, but when you're biblical and you take sanctification seriously, it seems to just open up all these other doors of these wonderful, beautiful, multifaceted aspects of the will of God. Now, let, let, me, give you, let me give you an example. Um, it's God's will that, that you be more useful. It is. I can tell you that. It's God's will that you be more fruitful. It is. But how can that be accomplished? Through sanctification. Through growing in conformity to the image of Christ. Now, it's God's will that your capacity for joy be expanded. Did you know that? that that's interesting. So many people have such a small capacity for joy. Remember Michael Card in one of his poems, the Nazarene could hunger and the Nazarene could cry and he could laugh with all the fullness of his heart. And those who hardly knew him and those who knew him well could see the contradiction from the start. Here was this Messiah in all his seriousness and yet could laugh, out laugh, out joy everyone around him as a perfect man. He had such a capacity for joy. And God wants you to have a capacity for joy, an ever increasing capacity for joy. How does that come? Through sanctification. Through sanctification. God desires that you have deeper, richer, and purer relationships with Him, with your wife, with your children, with your friends, with your husband. But how is that accomplished? How is that going to be accomplished? It's going to be accomplished sanctification. Growing, increasing in your conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to just share something with you. I, you know, I just love kind of, you know, the old country mechanic phrase, you know, well, there's your problem. You know, you don't know why your car's broke down. Well, there's your problem. <laughs> your back axle's gone, you see. And, and we have so many ways in which we try to 
like cut off the head of a many headed dragon. You cut one head off, another head appears. It's just no use. You got to drive a sword straight through the heart of that thing. And that's the whole idea about everything. Most of our problems in life, and I'm not talking about external problems like maybe persecution or, or something happened, you know, at our job or something like that. But a great deal of our problems comes from the fact that you're just not like Jesus. And I'm just not like Jesus. Wouldn't you say most of our marital problems are from the fact that we're just not like Jesus? Most of our problems in family, relationships, church, everything, we're just not like Jesus. So what is our great need? Our great need, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, we've been throwing around the word sanctification so far. Now, I'm going to try to tell you what it means. The agiasmos is the word. And it can also mean holiness or consecration. But here it refers to a process. A process in our daily lives in which God is working and we are working. God is working. And in response to the work of God, we are working to grow in a, how can I say this? A real a personal, a practical holiness. I mean, not just some mystical status, but that outwardly and inwardly, a holiness that, uh, a palpable holiness, a holiness that people can see and touch, that they can, as Paul told Timothy, that, that uh, other people should see his progress. Sanctification is the real work of God where progress is made in our inner man but becomes evident to other people. And that's so very important. Now, it's also called progressive sanctification. Why? Because it's the idea of progressing toward a goal. And that goal is being conformed to the image of Christ. It's the idea of advancing. Advancing. I used to love working up in the mountains of Peru, especially in the north. Sometimes if you were just walking down a trail and you met another man and uh, he was a brother in Christ and you said something like this, Como estas, hermano? How are you doing, brother? He would say, avanzando, hermano, avanzando. Advancing, advancing. That's a good thing. That's what we should be doing because I want you to know you're not staying in one place. You're either advancing or you're going backwards. So now, I want to give us some definitions of sanctification and I'm calling in some scholars to give us some help. I'm going to read them and I'll make comments on what they're saying because I want you to understand two things are going on here. One is our position in Christ. Before God in Christ, we are righteous, we are holy, we are separated. Um, that's, a, that's a done deal. And I want you to see that. And yet there's a practical side of that in which in this life we ought to be progressing in order to, well, let me put it this way, in order to become what we are or to start acting what we are, start living what we actually are in Christ. So many Christians, Charles Leiter always says this, so many Christians walk around and it's almost as if they're trying, in, in their striving for holiness, they're trying to be something they're not. And that's just the opposite. When you're striving for holiness, you're seeking to be what you are. And that is a saint, a child of God. Now, Leon Morris uh, says this, From the moment anyone believes he is set apart for God, set apart to be holy, in New Testament language, he's a saint. All right, that's the done deal. In Christ, that's who you are. Now, he says this does not mean that this believer is morally perfect, but that he is given over to God to do his will. You're not your own. You belong to God. If you're truly Christian, you belong to God, and you can't escape it. You cannot escape him. Get in your car, drive clear across the country to California. He will be there when you get there. You can't escape him. You can't escape his providence. As my children, in their young years, there's really nothing they can do. They're not going to escape their dad. Well, God has much more power than an earthly father. 
You belong to him now. So he's going to work in you. That's one of the reasons he has saved you. To demonstrate his power. He's going to work in you. You can buck up against it. You can do a lot of things. But it's going to happen. He's going to work in you. Now. He says, thus a process is begun in which the old ways and the old habits are increasingly done away and replaced with new ways that fit the service of God. So God is constantly working what? To do what? To remove from us our old ways. To put them to death. And to lead us into a new way, a new way of life that's fit for Him. That is according to Him. That works with who you now are. Do you see that? Now, thus a process is begun in which old ways and old habits are increasingly done away with and replaced with new ways that fit the service of God. This is a long and necessary prog- process and much of the New Testament is taken up with instructions as to how it may be furthered. So many people today are looking for just one thing, you know, some sort of experience that's going to catapult them into a state of sanctification. That's simply not True, although God can work at different times in our life and in unique ways and do certain things with certain experiences. I have no problem with that. But in the New Testament, the general course is this sanctification is a lifelong process. And one of the ways that we know that is not just because the New Testament says it. But also when you see the structure of the New Testament. Most of the material is given to what? To you changing. Isn't it? Most of it is about you learning to put off the old man. And to put on the new. And to live now according to what you are. Now. Here Paul lays it down firmly that it is God's will that God's people live in God's way. No more of everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. Listen to what he says again. Here Paul lays it down firmly that it is God's will that God's people live in God's way. You belong to him now. Different father. Different foundation. Different sphere. Different kingdom. Different everything. And that's why you start learning. And that's why you start striving. To put away the old habits of the flesh. To put on that new man that's Christ. Now, uh, David Williams, who's a little bit less well known than Leon Morris, gives us a beautiful uh, definition. He says, strictly, the word sanctification means to be set apart for God. But what is set apart for God must be worthy of him. And so agiasmos, which is sanctification, acquires an ethical meaning. You've been set apart. And yes, one day when he returns, you will be glorious transformed, gloriously transformed by the power of his appearing, by the power of his own person. But what you need to understand is that from the moment of conversion, you are entering into a process. You are not to use the second coming as an excuse. You are not to wait until that great day. But the moment you're born again, you enter in to a a striving, a race, a desire to be more and more like Christ. It is a process of becoming holy in the sense of good. Now listen to what he says. Of bringing Christian practice into line with Christian status. Now listen. Bringing Christian practice into line with Christian status. What is Christian status? Who you are in Christ. You're a new creature. You're a saint. You're a child of God. Now, what is sanctification? It's working to bring your practice in line with who you are. Do you see that? Now, don't you want that? And aren't you animated to be that? I remember a story, I think it was Warren Wiersbe, years ago, I I think. And I don't know which queen of England it was. But he tells a story about this young lady who was going to be queen of England and no one wanted to tell her. Because they were like, if this little girl finds out she's going to be queen, well, she'll be impossible. 
We won't be able to do anything with her. But then when she was 12 years old, they discovered, I mean, she just started acting different when she was 12. Completely different. Queenly-like. Royalty. Her manners and everything. And finally, someone asked her, what is the reason for the change? And she said, well, I discovered that I am to be queen. So I thought I should act like it now. In the scriptures, you discover that you are a saint. In the scriptures, you discover that you are a child of God. You are being called upon to act like it now. And there's a lot more power available for you to do that than what you probably now believe. So be encouraged. He says... Sanctification in this sense requires the work of a lifetime and will be completed only at the parousia, the coming of Christ. Now, a great many Christians, especially young Christians, especially college students or people before they get married, they're always like, what is the will of God for my life? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's your sanctification. And I would like to add this, that... I think that we spend an unhealthy amount of time trying to discern subjective aspects of God's will when if we would only take that time and energy and devote it to conforming our lives to what we know is the will of God in the scriptures. Listen, I don't want to be trite or cliched, but you concern yourself with holiness And God will concern himself with leading you into those subjective areas where you're not really sure. He will. Set yourself to being more holy. Now, um, throughout the scriptures, progressive sanctification is a synergistic work. Young preachers like to use that word. It's impressive. It is a synergistic work. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's the opposite of a monergistic work. You say, well, what does that mean? Mono, one. Your being born again, your regeneration, was a monergistic work. You didn't have any part in it. God birthed you. Not the will of man, not the power of man. God did it. Monergistic. God birthed you again by His power by his word that's monergistic but then after we enter into the Christian life what do we see on all the pages of the scriptures we see something synergistic don't we that God is working in us but God also calls us to work he calls us to act he calls us to respond now I um, I want us just to look at a few passages I don't think I'm going to get through my sermon tonight. So we'll, we're going to look at a few passages. And I just turn for a minute to Philippians 2, chapter 2, verse 12. Here we have a magnificent passage on the synergistic aspects of salvation, of sanctification. That God is working and we are responding Philippians 2, 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. He says work out your salvation. It doesn't mean work for your salvation. It means that you have been saved by the power of God. You've been saved By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you are in that sphere. Of God's salvation. And within that. Work. Work it out. Respond to God. Listen to his will. Obey it. Do what he says. Grow. Cultivate. This is extremely. Extremely important. The idea of work out. Is to me it communicates these words. Intentionality. Now let's just stop. Are you that way? With regard to holiness. Would someone see intentionality. 
That your intent. Would they see that? Intentionality. Also intensity. Would they see any intensity with which you are seeking to be more like Christ? Or is it just lackadaisical? Whatever may be will be. Well, if it comes my way. No. Such a wrong view of God's sovereignty. Nowhere in Scripture does God's sovereignty lead to apathy and complacency. Not in salvation. And not in sanctification. God's sovereignty is constantly calling and encouraging men to respond. Now, it's also this word work out is present tense. Continuous action. Something that we're always doing. Always striving. Always seeking. Always studying. Reading the word. Fellowshipping. Uh, avoiding influences of evil. Things like that. That we might grow in Christ. Also, I want you to look at the relationship between obey here and work out. Just look. In, in, in verse 12, he says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed. And then he says, work out your salvation. And so what, what I want you to see is that this idea of studying the scriptures. Of using well prayer, fellowship, the means of sanctification, grasping a hold of those, taking those seriously. That's not a suggestion. It's not an option to be taken by the spiritually elite. It is a command. You are to take seriously your growth in holiness. We take so many things seriously. And we just skip over the real need. It seems like every kind of book that's written lately or in the Christian life is about treating symptoms and not treating the core need. That is just being more holy. Being more holy. Now, also 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Let me read that to you. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I want to emphasize here two words. Cleanse is one of them and perfecting the other. Cleanse is aorist tense. It's like make a break. Get rid of. Of the filth in your life. Get rid of the influences. Separate yourself from those things that are contaminating you. And doing damage to your walk and your testimony. Most importantly to the inward health of your soul. Once and for all just get rid of that. And once you get rid of it. Then go on perfecting. In holiness. What does that mean? It means that we would... Cultivate a complete holiness in our lives that we would be working and striving and reading and praying and fellowshipping that we might become more and more and more holy. And we go on doing this. Seeking ever to reach the goal. Now, first Peter 114 as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the former lust which was yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust. That's present tense. There is a sense in which the world is always trying to influence you. Always. And you've always got to fight against it. Tenaciously. Tenaciously. I like to look at it with the illustration that was given Cain. Sin is waiting at the door. And its desire is to have you. It is. And so you have to take separation seriously. Again, I know that every time most contemporary Christians hear that word, they're thinking legalism. I'm not talking about legalism. But I am talking about recognizing the things that Scripture says are dangerous and avoiding them. And there is a reason, I believe, while the children of, the children of Israel, when they were brought into the land of Canaan, were told to not have pity on those tribes. 
those wicked, polytheistic, immoral tribes. They were to take them with a vengeance. Now we're not in any way to take anyone with a vengeance today. But I think the idea is this. When you see an influence. Man, don't. Don't make friends with that thing. When you see an ungodly influence, don't make friends with it. Don't coddle it. Don't compromise. Don't figure out a way that you can walk hand by hand. No, drive a stake straight through its heart. It will always be coming. You must always be on guard. And then it says... Not only as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which was yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves. Be holy. This is not present tense. I believe it's indicating that that we should constantly be be fighting against the influences of this world that would contaminate us in order to strive to reach a goal once and for all to be holy. And you can say, yes, Brother Paul, but the Bible says in the Bible that that's not going to happen until Jesus comes back. And I tell you, the Bible never uses that as an excuse for complacency. It tells us to be holy. Seek to be holy. To be a holy instrument in the hands of God. And that's not just referring to preachers. It's referring to all of us. Because we all long to be instruments. To be used of Him. Cleanness. Holiness is necessary. Now. I'm going to give you one last text. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace. With all men. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace. If I remember correctly, remember when we were looking at Paul and he said that the unbelieving Jews had persecuted him. Well, I think the word there was ekdioko, which persecuted him out. Ek meaning out, away from. Here the word is dioko, which also means to pursue, to follow, to persecute. Now it's not telling us to persecute sanctification. But what he's saying is, just like a persecutor would tenaciously chase after the person that they're persecuting, so you and I should chase after holiness. We should pursue it. Again, there's the idea here of intentionality, intensity to pursue holiness like an Olympian pursues an Olympic medal. present tense always pursuing holiness you see you know this don't you but you forgot didn't you we go throughout our lives we hear this we know it's true we read it we know it's true but we need to be reminded of it and we need to be reminded more often pursue holiness I don't know what God's will is for my life pursue holiness I'm having trouble in my marriage Pursue holiness. My children just don't respect me. Pursue holiness. We're always fix the children, fix the wife, fix this, fix this. No, fix me. Fix me. Make me right. I want to end with an illustration, maybe a little radical. I saw it on YouTube. This motivational thing for football players. Thought it was really something. This young man, I mean, really, athlete, tells his coach, I want to play pro football. I want to play pro football. And the coach, man, he was big and he was bad. He looked at him and he said, you want to play pro football? He said, yeah, I do. He said, all right, meet me tomorrow morning at the beach. Okay. So it's early morning. He meets the coach out there on the beach. Coach takes him by the shoulder and 
leads him into the water, leads him a little further into the water, leads him into the water until he's over his head. And then the coach grabs him by the head. And I, I don't suggest this as a tactic for training, okay? It's an illustration. Grabs him by the head and the back of the neck and shoves him under the water and holds him there. Now that kid was strong. He was strong as that coach. And that coach kept holding him and kept holding him and kept holding him under that water. That kid, his whole body is screaming, I must breathe. Every fiber of his body said, I must breathe. If I don't breathe, I'll die. And just when he was about to pass out, the coach pulled him out of the water, drug him up on the beach and said, Now, when you want to play football as bad as you wanted to breathe while you were under that water, then we'll talk. Now let's use that illustration ourselves. You want to be holy. You want God to use you. What does that mean to you in our American culture today? So soft. And so careful not to hurt itself. What does that mean to you? You're going to study the Bible five minutes a day? What does it mean to you? You're going to drop to your knees? Making sure you've got your coffee first? What does that mean to you? You see, we can talk all day about we need to be holy. Everyone says, Amen. How bad do you want to be holy? I hear so many people that I'm just, I'm just not holy. I just, I go, Yes, that's a common malady, but let me ask you a question. What are you doing? Well, nothing really. Or I'm doing some things, but I haven't really thought through it. I haven't really even in investigated the scriptures to see if I'm doing the right thing. There's no intentionality. There's no zeal. There's no idea of this sin in my life. I'm going to drive a stake straight through its heart. I'm not saying this to condemn you. But I am saying this to bring it before your eyes. We're a soft people. We coddle ourselves far too much. We whine. We whine. But to be active in faith, to believe that he who began a good work in us will finish it. Now there's, there's some encouragement. I think it may come down to belief. Most things do. I know we don't talk much about faith, us reform guys, because there's so much stuff about faith out there. It's wrong. But believe the promises. That there's far more. Of God's life and power available to you and I. Than what we now possess. The scriptures say it's there. Is that a lie? Well, if it's true, should we not go after it with all our heart? Everyone says, Brother Paul, my great problem is just I don't have life. There's just no <laughs> vibrancy, no zeal, and there's no power. But it's there. He promised it. And it is our prerogative to seek. You say, well, I saw it. How long? 30 minutes. Twice a week for half a month. It is our duty to seek. It is God's prerogative, sovereign decision of when He gives. But He will give if you do seek. Brothers, sisters, be encouraged. So many promises with regard to our sanctification. We can be much more than what we, we think. Don't settle for anything but Christ likeness. Don't see that you failed and castigate yourself. Don't walk around moping. You failed, so be it. Confess it. Start again with joy and hope. Be holy. Be clean. 
Be like him. You do that, you won't have to be a militant people. People will know just by what you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, dear God. Oh, Lord. Your promises are so deep and wide. High. Your faithfulness, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Lord, help your people. Help your people. Help this people. Lord, bountiful, great measures of grace be poured out on this flock. Great hope, Lord. Great encouragement. That you will do immeasurably above all that we can ask or think. Lord, help your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Now, it might do well for some of you to go home tonight and think about the things that you've heard. Be very careful how the devil will steal a word out of your heart. Think about this. Now, the reason why I give this ending here is because we're so prone to now just shut everything off. Wow, that was okay. Now what are we going to talk about? Well, it's all right. If you've got things to talk about after the service is over, that's fine. But don't forget what you've heard. Because you know this is the core of your problems, isn't it? It's the core of your problems. A lack of conformity to the image of Jesus Christ. So if we deal with this core, this problem, everything else, well, it'll, it'll be okay. All right, God, God's blessing on you.